All right, tonight, I thought we would uh, start uh, some studies in uh, what they call the minor prophets, the minor prophets in the Old Testament. <laughs> they're called minor not because they're less important than the other ones. You know, the four major prophets are Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and uh, Jeremiah. They call them major because they're longer and, they, and their scope is more is, is more is, is wider, it covers a greater period of time. The minor prophets are just as important, they're just as anointed as the other ones, but they were more localized and, and more focused on a particular, uh, particular period of time, and they're also shorter in length. So they're called minor, not because they're less important, it's because they're smaller. Yet they, they contain as much powerful teaching and preaching these were anointed men of God, individuals who God called to speak his word to their, to their generation, to their nation. And uh, the very first minor prophet is a fellow named Hosea, and that's where we're going to start. Uh, the one thing that we read in the prophets, when you read through the prophets of the Old Testament, is they, they preached a hard message. They would pronounce God's judgment on, their, on the people. When God speaking to people, you know, if God speaks, everybody says, I want to hear God speak. In the, in the Old Testament, when God spoke through a prophet, it was usually correction or direction or admonishment or, you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't like a pat on the back and say, hey, you're doing a great job. Okay? It was usually a warning. And sometimes the warnings were very, very harsh and very, very powerful. But yet, they were always done. The underlying foundation of everything God said through the prophets was the foundation of grace and mercy. Because the reason why he warned his people was to keep them from the judgment that he would have to deliver. God has to judge sin. He has to deal with sin. Even in the life of a believer, we're saved, we're covered with the blood, we're accepted in the beloved. But if we begin to stray in the beloved, God has to deal with He can't let us go on with that and bear the name of Christ without doing something to bring a stop to it. And he doesn't do it because he's mean, or he doesn't do it because he's angry. He doesn't, well, he is angry, excuse me. He, it does make him angry. But he doesn't do it because he wants to punish. He wants to correct. There's a difference. There's a difference between punishment and correction. Okay? And throughout, when we're reading these prophets, and we're not going to necessarily look at every verse, every verse, but just to get the gist of some of the things that we're saying, because they're just as pertinent today with us as New Testament believers as they were back with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, Hosea is the first of the minor prophets. And it says in chapter 1 and verse 1, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Beeri in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash, king of Israel. In other words, he puts them in a time frame. He lived about the same time as Isaiah. But his ministry was not necessarily to Judah. His ministry was more to the northern kingdom. We always have to, when we look at the prophets, we always have to remind ourselves that there were two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom, and then there was Judah and Benjamin. They, were, they occupied Jerusalem. Right after the reign of Solomon, there was a split uh, between the, 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 the ten tribes and the two tribes. And they went north, and they became the northern kingdom. And if you read through the Old Testament history books, you find out that the, the Judah and Benjamin in Jerusalem, they had some good kings and they had some rotten kings. The northern kingdom never had a good king. They started out with a guy named Jeroboam the first, and from that point it was like downhill. They had back they had kings like Ahaz, who was a horrible king. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, that horrible king, horrible leadership. And his children. And all, you know, all the kings of the northern, the northern tribes are evil. Hosea was sent to the northern tribes to bring a message to them. 
a message of warning that they ultimately rejected. But when you read these prophets now today, you know, they say that people, human beings are visually, you know, we, we like to see things. That's why we have PowerPoint presentations and we put things on the screen and, and so forth. Well, you know what? They didn't have PowerPoint back in Hosea's day. They didn't even have felt boards. I mean, they didn't even have, like, overhead projectors. They, they, so when God wanted to demonstrate something, he would call a prophet. Now, these, for these people today that want to be prophets, you know, I wonder if they would have wanted to have been a prophet in God's day. Because he would call the prophet to act out what was going on in, in the natural, whatever was going on in the heavenlies, he would call a prophet to act it out in the natural. So that everybody could see, they couldn't watch it on TV or watch it on a PowerPoint, but they would just watch the prophet and see what he was doing. For instance, I think it was Ezekiel who told him to lie on his side for like 45 days, or however long it was. You know, just lay on your side. Then you got to lay on the other side for a while. And, and they would look and say, and they'd say, Ezekiel, what are you doing? And he would give God's word of why God told him to do that. It was a picture. He told Jeremiah to, to put on a, a garment for a while and then take it off and bury it. And then dig it up a while later and put it back on after it was all rotten and moth-eaten. And he would walk around. They would say, Jeremiah, why are you wearing that moth-eaten, that rotten garment? And he would say, well, this is you know, what God thinks about you. He would, that, that was the way that God would get his point across. Well, listen to what he told Hosea to do in verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. Go and marry a prostitute. Not, not somebody who was like an ex-prostitute, who got saved and, <laughs> okay. No, no. Go find, go down to the viaduct, go, go find, go marry a prostitute. He says, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land has committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So when they would, some, one of Hosea's friends would come up to him and say, Hosea, do you know what you're doing? Why are you marrying a prostitute? He would say, because Israel has become a prostitute. That was his, that was the, that's God wanted to show to his people what they could see. What they were doing to the Lord is what, what God wanted Hosea to show. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, which conceived and bare him son. So he found this prostitute named Gomer. And the Lord said, they had, a, they had a child, they had a son. And the Lord said unto him, call his name Jezreel. That word Jezreel means to scatter, like seed. He says, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause the, uh, to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, to put this in perspective, Jehu, okay, uh, if you go back in the history of the northern kingdom, there was King Ahab and Jezebel, okay, who were wicked. God called Jehu to wipe out Ahab and Jezebel and, and take the kingdom. Well, the thing is, Jehu went a little too far. He went way beyond what God told him to do, and, and he became as much an idolater as they were, okay? So this first son, his name is Jezreel, and it, uh, it means he's uh, basically God's saying, I'm going to scatter Israel. And he did just that. Years after this, they were conquered by the Assyrians, and, and he, uh, they came and they took them and just, just re repatriated them everywhere, Okay? Verse 5, and it shall come to pass that that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel, which, by the way, is Armageddon. It's where the, the, the valley of Armageddon. Okay, verse 6. <laughs> so she had a son, Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And God said unto him, call her name Lo Ruhamah. Lo Ruhamah means no mercy. In Hebrew, whenever you see L-O in, in front of a word, it's like the negative. So, ruhama means merciful. Lo ruhama means no mercy. He says, For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Somebody will say, 
Hosea, why your name and your daughter? No mercy. And he would say, because God's not going to have mercy on us if we keep up this idolatry. You see, that's the way. That's Anybody want to be a prophet? Okay. I don't want to be a prophet if i got to do stuff like this. Okay. But listen to what he says in verse 7. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow nor by sword nor by battle by horse. But, uh, uh, by horses nor by horsemen. He was saying, I'm going to, I'm going to spare uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, and he did until they refused to repent, and God sent judgment there too. But, okay, now, verse 8. So you've got two sons. I'm going to scatter you. I'm not going to have any mercy. Now, verse 8. A son and a daughter. I'm sorry. Verse 8. Now when she had weaned Loruhamah, she conceived and bore a son, a third child. Then, God, uh, then said God, call his name Lo-Ami, which means not my people. Now, if they would have named him Ami, my people, that's a good name. What are you going to name your son? My people. But he named him not my people. Somebody say, well, why are you going to name your son not my people? Because God told me to because he's going to disown you as his people. He's not going to have mercy on you. He's going to scatter you. He's going to disown you. You see, this is, what, this is how God used the prophet in those days. Then said God, in verse 9, call his name Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Boy, I never want to hear that. You know, at the very end, if you go back to Revelation, he says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Here he's telling his people, I'm not going to be your God, you're not going to be my people. After all this, He's warning them. He's not doing this because he wants to send them into captivity, but they wouldn't listen to him. So all this stuff that he's saying is pretty harsh. I'm going to scatter you. I'm not going to have mercy. I'm, you're not my people. But that's not the end of the passage here. Look at verse 10. Yet the number, this is what God says in the prophet, yet the number of children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. God promised restoration. God promised reconciliation. He promised to restore them as his people. But all what they were going to have to go through. In fact, they're still going through it. The nation of Israel is still going through it. They've been through ghettos, through holocaust, through everything for 2,000 years. And even longer than that, if you go back before Christ. And they're still going through it, and we'll go through it until Jesus comes back. Just like our brother said Sunday, when he comes back, it's not going to be to Moscow, it's not going to be to Washington, it's not going to be London, it's going to be to Jerusalem. And if you read throughout the Old Testament, you find out when he does come back, that's when the nation of Israel is going to own Christ. When they see the, 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 the wounds in his hands, they're going to own him as their Messiah at that point. It hasn't happened yet. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying for the return of Jesus Christ. Because it's, it's the same thing. Today, I, I, was, I had a fellow in here, I, I, had, I sold an instrument. I put it on Craigslist, and the guy wanted to come to see it, and he bought it. And he came in, and after we were done making it, he looked around, and he said, oh, this is an old church. I said, yeah, and we were talking a little bit, and he said, I see an American flag and a, and a, and a Jewish flag over here, he says. He says, how come? I said, well, we believe that, you know, God said, if you bless Israel, he'll bless you. If you curse Israel, he'll curse you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is coming back. So he said, well, you think uh, they deserve being a land over there? I said, I'm thinking, <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah. He said, well, okay, well, we'll see you later. Went out the door, he went. Okay, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Not everybody, that's not a very popular thing nowadays. Even in some churches, sad to say. You know, Jerusalem, Israel. Okay, but, all right. He says in verse 11, Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. He's talking about, again, if we look into the future, the battle of Armageddon, when Christ returns at the end of that battle, that's when he'll bring the culmination, everything. He'll begin his millennial reign on this earth. Now look at chapter 2. 
And just reading a little bit more here, and then we're going to look in the New Testament. He says, Say ye to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamai, your brother, my people, and to your sister, uh, Mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries out of her breast. This is what, this is what God, this is his point. He doesn't want to punish people. He didn't, he didn't choose Israel just to cast them off. But he was pleading with them, just like he said in Isaiah, come let us reason together. He wants, he wants to draw them back. Even today in the body of Christ with, with believers and with Christians, he pleads with us, please come back. Please, please quit committing adultery. You know, James said, you adulterers and adulteresses, you love the world and all this other stuff. God says, please come back. He's saying it to the church. Please come back from your foolishness. Please come back from your idolatry to the body of Christ. He says, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. Oh, listen, I don't, you, you know, somebody, uh, we were talking the other day, I think, I forget who, who brought it up, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, message, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You ever hear that message? Well, God help us, saints in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> You know, we might not be looking at hell, but my goodness, if, if, we, you know, if we're saved and we're, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we belong to Him, what business do we have looking after other things? Committing adultery, spiritual idolatry. God, see, He's, he's saying, Hosea, do this, so when they ask you what's going on, you say, well, this is what you're doing to the Lord. It's sad to say this is what's going on a lot in the body of Christ, in the Lord. You know, in the Lord. And I don't understand it. I don't, I, I mean, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box, but I don't understand how people can be so, so stupefied. So, and and I'll just, some of you may have heard of that, that pastor uh, down, in, down in Atlanta that was, uh, they, they, he was caught up in, in some, some funny business, some homosexual stuff. Okay. Now you would think, that the people in that church would say, hey, Pastor, listen, you need to go and get some help. But they're lifting him up like he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And there was, there's honest, I, I couldn't believe this. Frank told me about this, and I looked, it, I looked it up on the Internet. They had a service in their church. And they got a copy of, of the Torah. You ever see a Torah like in a Jewish synagogue? It's on two scrolls. Okay, lambskin. And they wrapped it around this guy. And they like crowned him a king. And, and the place is packed out with probably a couple thousand people. And they're all jumping. And saying, yeah. I'm thinking, what is wrong with this picture? You know, what is with that? People are so stupid. Like lambs being led to the slaughter. And God's crying out and saying, what's wrong with you? Don't you hear me? Don't get, look. What's what's this? What's what's this say? Reading a little bit more, and you have to forgive me because some of this stuff amazes me. It really does. How can people be so stupid? And I hate to be judgmental. I mean, I don't like to look my, down my nose at anybody, but, but people are just stupid. All right. He, it says. Verse 4, I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother has played the harlot she has, that conceived them, has done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax and my oil. We're running after everything except Christ. They, they were running after everything except the God that brought them out of Egypt, that gave them everything they had. And God's saying, like, what do you want? Okay. Now, now look at his mercy. Let's just pass down a little bit. And there's a lot. Look at chapter 3. Hosea says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. By this time, Hosea would have said, Hey, you know, the Lord. I mean, I don't know. We, we don't read. I mean, we, we're not told their reaction. But if, it, if I would have been Hosea and God would have told me this, I would have said, 
I might have said it before. What do you want me to do? Okay. Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the, to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Love her like I love you. Who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. He still loved his people even though they were going after other gods. He still loved them. Now you just can't stop loving somebody if you really love somebody. No matter what they do to you. Some of us, we've been stepped on, lied to, everything else. You can't stop loving somebody if you really love them. It takes a while. So I bought her. Now listen to what it says. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver. And the picture here is this woman was an adulteress. She was sold into slavery. She was a prostitute. And she ended up being sold as a slave. She had left her husband. Uh, Hosea, she had gone off in the prostitution, in, adult, in, in, in wickedness, in adultery. He bought her back. She didn't deserve to be bought back. She had done nothing. She didn't plead with him to buy her back. She had not done anything to rectify what she had done. She hadn't repented. She hadn't cried out. She was being sold in the slave market. He said, I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said to her, you shall abide for me many days. I shall not play the harlot and you will not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. This is what God is saying is this is what I'm going to do for my nation Israel. I'm going to buy them back. I'm going to make it so they, they're not going to be able to resist my love. You read over in Jeremiah chapter 30, 31, 32, 33. He talks about the time when he will establish his word in their heart. And they'll no longer have to teach each other the law. The nation of Israel. That's the love that God has for them. And that's the love that God has for us. That's the love that God has for the backslider. That's the love that God has for those who have gone astray. Sometimes he has to allow judgment. Sometimes he has to allow things to happen. But it's always for the purpose of bringing us back. Bringing us back. I'm so glad that he wants to bring us back. I'm so glad that there's not anything I can do that would make God just write me off completely. If we reject him, if we reject his love and continually reject and continually reject, we read that our hearts can become hardened. But when does he give up on, him, on, 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 on a backslider? When does he give up on a, on a believer? You know, we give up a lot, a lot quicker than he does. Okay? I'm going to look one more passage here in Hosea, and we're going to turn to the New Testament. Over, over in chapter 6. <clears throat> we'll start with verse 4. He says, O Ephraim which was another name for the northern tribes of Israel. What shall I do unto thee? O Judah, shall I, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goes away. In other words, your goodness is there for a few minutes, and it's just, just like fog in the morning. It burns off. He says, Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goes forth. He says, I have, I have I've, I've, I've spoke to you through the prophets. I've, I've preached some heavy message to you through the prophets, but you're still not listening. He said in verse 6, For I desired mercy. He desires us as believers. He desired his people to have mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, they were so caught up in religion that they had missed the point of their religion especially in the northern kingdom. Because, again, if you read the history of the northern kingdoms, what they did when, when Jeroboam broke off from, from Judah and Benjamin, the first thing he did was he set up two golden calves to worship in Samaria. So they had, they had the sacrifice, they had worship, they had religion, but God says, listen, I'm not interested in your religion. I want mercy and the knowledge of God. I want you to know me and have mercy on one on another. Because this is my heart toward you. You know, when we talk about a relationship, a relationship isn't going through a lot of rituals and doing things over and over and the same thing over and over again. A relationship is communication, it's love, it's fellowship, it's, 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 it's taking time together. 
This is what God wanted with Israel, and this is, what, this is what God wants with us. But we've turned it in, and when I say we, I mean like the church. We've turned it into a ritual. We've turned it into a, a, a club. We've turned it into a belonging, a membership. It's, it, it's a personal relationship. That's where it has to begin. Everything we do as a body has to begin with personal relationships. Your personal relationship with Christ is more important than your relationship with me or anybody else, even with your spouse. Your relationship with Christ is the most important thing. He says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have the, uh, there have they dealt treacherously against me. And he goes on and he talks about you know, the, the places where, what, look, look what it says. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. It should have been a city of refuge. But instead, he said, as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Listen, he could say that today. Because God hasn't changed and people haven't changed. In the body of Christ. Now, this is a lot of harsh stuff. This is a lot of harsh stuff going on that God is saying, listen, He is angry. He's heartbroken when the people that He loves so very much stick their nose up in the air and go the other way. There's another place where He talks about when they pull the shoulder away. You know, you ever put your hand on somebody's shoulder and they go like this? I mean, has God ever put his hand on your shoulder and you went like this? Don't bother me. That's what people do. That's what we do as believers. That's what the church has done. That's what Israel was doing. Now, all that to say this is all Old Testament stuff. I want you to turn with me over to Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 9. When Jesus came here, when Jesus came here, he encountered the same kind of thing that the prophets encountered in the Old Testament. Although the people had not fallen into that kind of idolatry, during the times of the prophets, they were actually worshiping other idols. When Jesus came here, they had not worshipped idols per se, as they were setting up idols in the temple and so forth, but they fell into another kind of Idolatry. They worship their religion more than anything. They worship their the Judaism. They worship the rules. The Apostle Paul talks about being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as touching the law of, uh, righteous uh, above reproach. I mean, they worshipped their own righteousness. Now look at chapter nine. And starting at verse 9. Uh, look at verse 9. We can look at the first part of the chapter, but just. Uh, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Now, Matthew, his last name was Levi, Matthew Levi. He was a Jew, but he was a tax collector. How many people like tax collectors? How many people here like to pay taxes? Okay, nobody likes to pay taxes. They didn't like to pay them back then either. And they particularly didn't like to pay them back then because what the tax collectors would do back then, what Matthew was, and again, if you, if you study this out, he was sitting at the receipt of custom. In other words, he would set his booth up right where the fishermen would come in. And the Romans required, they taxed everything. Okay, that's how they got a lot of money. They, when they moved into a country, they wouldn't like destroy it, but they'd let everybody continue doing what they're doing, and they tax them. Okay, 
So Matthew was in, he was like in bed with the Romans. He was buddies with the Romans. And he was, he was exacting taxes from the fishermen who were coming in off the ship, who were like Peter and James and John, right? So Peter and James and John, they didn't like Matthew, if, you know, we, we put this in perspective here. Jesus went up to Matthew, who was a hated, he would have been considered a traitor to the nation of Israel. He would not have gone to the temple. They wouldn't let him in. He, he would not have gone to the synagogue. They would have stoned him because they, would, they considered him a traitor and a turncoat. The, the, real, the Israelites would have disowned him because he, he was working with the enemy. Jesus saw this man named Matthew, and he said unto him, follow me. Now, again, I, I, I like to just think the scenario in my mind, and it doesn't really tell us here, okay? So I always like to say when it's things that I imagine. But I could imagine Peter, James, and John standing there with Peter, or with Jesus. After having paid this Matthew guy all their tax money for their fish, they didn't like him. And Jesus is saying, Matthew, follow me. It says that Matthew got up. Now, this is something. He followed him. He left a very lucrative position. He was making some money. He got up, and he followed him. I wonder... And again, this is, please, this is just, I wonder, I wonder how much teaching Matthew heard Jesus do. There on the seashore, if, if, if you read it, you know, many times Jesus would teach from a boat uh, off, off, the, off the shore. And this was his kind of home territory up here around the Sea of Galilee and so forth. And I wonder if there were times when Matthew would just sitting back in his booth waiting and hearing Jesus teach. And Jesus ain't looking at him. And again, I wonder, and, and again, this is just my own, you can, you can write this off. This is just my own way of thinking of things. I wonder if Matthew was sitting there thinking, wow, I really wish he would come and talk to me. Hated. These Jews hate me. My, my, they've disowned me. My name's like a swear word. And we hear Jesus talk about the kingdom. And do teachings and, and see the healings he would do. He must have been hearing something for him to just get up and say, yeah, I'll follow you. We never know. When you go up to somebody on the street, you talk to a waitress in a, in a restaurant, you hand out a tract to somebody, you don't know how much that ground has been plowed by somebody else. You know, that person might just be waiting for you to give them a kind word. They might have heard, seen, and they might be wishing, man, I wish somebody would tell me about Jesus. And you could be the one. Listen, I know I'm, I'm, I'm adding my own opinions in here. Forgive me for doing that. It came to pass. Now, look what Jesus did. Matthew got up, said, I'll follow you. He said, come on, Jesus, come over to my house for dinner. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, Matthew invited his friends. His friends were not the Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem. They would have considered his house unclean. I ain't going to that place. I'll be defiled. He's a traitor. He's a turncoat. So it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, oh, he said, why is your master eating with these sinners? Just imagine that. Going in the house of a sinner. Well, they would never be caught dead in one of them places. But of course they wouldn't. That's why a sinner would never come into the, play, into the temple. You know, there's some folks sitting up in church. I ain't messing with that bunch. Well, that's, well, that's why they ain't going to mess with your bunch. Okay. 
When the Pharisees saw it, they said, Why eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. Now, now the connection back to Hosea. Jesus quotes Hosea. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, before a person can come to Christ, they got to realize they're a sinner. They got to realize that they are the object of God's judgment. Before the nation of Israel will ever accept Jesus as their Messiah. They've been through holocaust and ghettos and persecution and inquisition for all these years. And, and now they're, they're a little nation where the whole world's coming against them. Before we can know the mercy of God, we've got to realize how much we need His mercy. And when we do receive his mercy, we need to become vessels to give it to somebody else. He says, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? Repentance. When God, through the prophet Hosea, was calling out to his people, he was calling them to, a, to repentance. Come back. Change your ways. Quit going after your idols. Quit going after your lovers. I'll take you back. Come back. He's saying the same stuff, the same thing to us. We find ourselves, and, I've, and I, if you're like me, I'm so easily distracted. If I, if I don't make a daily effort to keep my, my eyes focused on Jesus, I'm so easily distracted. I'm walking, following the Lord, praying, reading, meditating on his word. But let one little. Huh? You sit down, you decide you're going to sit down. I'm going to pray. You start praying. Ring, ring. Huh? You're sitting, you're sitting, you're reading. And, and, and you start you, you reading, and you start thinking, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if, uh, boy, I, 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 need a, I got a phone call I need to make. See, here's the thing. If we, if we allow ourselves to keep getting distracted, we're going to get to the point where we're going to turn around and look, and we're going to say, where'd we, where, where'd we go? It's like Israel. Just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, they were holy, they were righteous, they were religious. Man, they, were, they, they had it all together. But they were lost and on their way to hell. Why? Because they, they loved their religion. Their, their religion became their idol. And they were good at it. We do the same thing. We let something else become our idol. As individuals and as a church, the body of Christ in America. I'm kind of preaching to the choir. I know that. But see, when we see these things happen, and, and none of us are beyond, we're, we're all susceptible. We're all susceptible. God, break our hearts. And see, I can say this I'm not a sinner, I'm a saved sinner. See, I, I was a sinner. I got saved. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. I ain't a sinner no more. Okay. If I, if, I, if I allow my head to be turned, I'm going to start acting like one. See, there's a whole lot of folks that saved that act like sinners. That's when God has to say, hey, Hosea, go marry a prostitute. 
so they can get a good look at what they're doing to me. Do we realize that when we allow our head to get turned from God to something else, it's like committing adultery. We're prostituting ourselves. How much of the church has prostituted itself? When certain leaders of the church in America decided they wanted to get more people in the doors, they went out and took surveys. And they asked the folks, what do you want in church? What, 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 would, what don't you like about church? And what, what, what would you like to see in church? And they, they heard things like, well, we don't want to be like, we don't want to be made to feel guilty in church. When you come face to face with the holy God, you're going to feel guilty. You can't come when Isaiah was in his presence. He said, I'm undone. They said, you know, that cross and the blood. And so I said, well, listen, if we, just, if we just downplay the sin thing and we'll, we'll replace the crosses with nice pictures and, 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 and we won't sing them war songs anymore, you know, onward Christian songs, a war. They don't want we'll get people to come in. And they did. And maybe, you know, maybe there's gospel being preached. I don't know. I don't know. But when we get our eyes turned, Hosea's message to us is, listen, come back. Come back. I love you. I'll buy you back. I'll take you. I don't care how, I don't care how far you've gone. I don't care what you've done. I'll take you back. Jesus said to go into the highways and byways and compel them. Not with, you know, stuff to make them, to amuse them, but compel them with the truth. I'm telling you what, more and more people today realize they need something 